This week has been a week of reminders for me. Um, I was dealing with just some personal things throughout the week. Nothing big, nothing major. They just started building up, though, and I, I thought, okay, just swallow them down and it'll be okay. Um, and then Wednesday happened. I'm not talking about Valentine's Day and spending time with my wife and children. I'm talking about hearing what happened in Parkland, Florida. And even though we've been through this before, for some reason it still shook me this time around. Um, more than anything else, it reminded me of how weak and fragile we are. How something like that can happen, how lives can be taken. And how easy it is to happen. Then I was trying to remind myself and in prayer and remind myself of, of good things as well. I started remembering people in our church that are encouragements to me through their service, through their kindness, through their compassion. You know, I thought, I'd, I, thought it was, I was filled up with joy about all kinds, and then I walked out in the children's hallway just a few minutes ago to pass out the elements, and I saw a guy dressed up in Middle Eastern garb to be the Apostle Paul for these little children so they can get a better understanding of the Bible. I'm appreciative of a guy like Guy Holloway. You know how rare it is to find someone that has founded a church for over and been there as a pastor for over 30 years and then be glad to just be on the sidelines and serve in every little way he can serve and be my biggest supporter during my sermons? You don't find people like that. We are blessed as a church to have a guy in gay. A third reminder this past week, <clears throat> someone put on Facebook about one of Spurgeon's favorite books of all time was John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Um, if you've never read through Pilgrim's Progress, I highly recommend it, um, especially if you can find one that is modernized English. Uh, not many of us are trained in the KJV uh, language, um, so if you can find one that's modernized, great. But here's, here's the wonderful thing about uh, Pilgrim's Progress. It's not just some fiction uh, to be read as if it doesn't apply to your life. Bunyan didn't even intend to write it when he started writing it. Um, but as a pastor and as a theologian, he ended up writing out um, this imagery that describes the Christian journey from first hearing the gospel <clears throat> uh, to the point of with the Spirit convicting you of your need for it and then uh, coming to faith in Christ and then staying on the narrow way in the midst of all kinds of trials and temptations. And Christian meets a couple of people, just a few people, that are also Christian, sincere believers, but he meets many that are imposters. He also meets many that would try to dissuade him from following in the Christian life and to turn away. Um, one of my favorite parts of John Bunyan's entire story is toward the end, right before he gets to the celestial city, when he's about to walk through this, this river. The, um, the believer that's right, that was next to him had no trouble going across. But whenever a Christian goes to cross, he starts to sink. He starts to despair. And he starts to wonder, am I truly a Christian? Did I really believe? Is this, is God, has God really saved me? And I'm paraphrasing him anyways. Um, and his friend is encouraging him that God is actually letting him be tested because he's one of his special saints. That he will let him be tested in this way to display God's grace in Christian. And Christian comes through by faith. Today's passage, we're... Um, we're reminded by Jesus that his true disciples are those that believe his word, those that God has given them life, and those that endure, just like Christian we were talking about in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. So with that, um, let's pray, and then we'll um, start looking at the word together. Lord, this is not about us. This is about you. This is the word that you have breathed into us, by your spirit. This is about your word that is over us. And this is about your life in us. So this is your mission. We are your people. And this is your time. I pray that you would use it to encourage our hearts. And at the same time, to have us examine our hearts. It is in Christ's glorious name that we pray. Amen. <coughs> now, as you know, we've been going through John chapter 6. Uh, this has been a delight to me, um, I can't think of any other word right now to use, uh, to go through the Bread of Life discourse. <clears throat> now that doesn't mean that it was easy to accept uh, for those that, um, that first heard it or those who hear it now. You see, there's, there's controversy that's been going on. Um, these people that came, they wanted to, to 
follow Jesus because of the things that he had given them. He gives them some hard teaching. And so let's look at, let's look at this uh, again. And thank you, Debbie, for reading it earlier. In verse 60, it says, When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? <clears throat> As you'll see, I have uh, three main points I want to get across um, in our passage. And uh, the first one is, true disciples of Christ believe Jesus' words. Uh, I'm just going to show you my notes today. Um, this is what I have of the scriptures. I broke, it, broke this passage down into three parts. The, that, that which is jello is true disciples of Christ believe Jesus' words. It's kind of cool when you see it like this, uh, how it all works together, bring these things out. That I'm trying to pull it forth from God's word. Um, but before I go further, I also want to give you a heads up. I'm actually going to try to be shorter than I normally am this morning. Um, some of you are worried and scared, thinking that means I'm going to go faster. Um, I'm going to still try to be go slowly. And slow might not be slow to some, but I'm going to try to go slow for me. Uh, and I'm going to try to be straightforward this morning. Um, so uh, we have a lot going on in service this morning. I don't, I don't want to distract you just at, with extra stuff, so I'll just try to be straightforward. So... Um, dealing with this, true disciples of Christ believe in Jesus' words. Uh, understand that there is a controversy going on, and that controversy is over Jesus and his words. Uh, it's not over some thought um, that might be out there or some philosophy. Um, Jesus himself is controversial. This is not um, some master that we ser serve that is just easygoing and easy speaking. Um, he's going to say some things that are difficult. Things that might be hard to swallow. Uh, when you hear, hear them saying that right there, this is a hard saying. Uh, one way you can understand that is using our imagery of food that we've been going through in John chapter 6. This word is hard to swallow. This one's hard to take down. Uh, and so when it says in the ESV, who can listen to it, uh, you have this idea with listen to it. It probably has the understanding of who can, who can adhere to it. Who can actually listen to that and let it penetrate their hearts so that they actually live according to that? Basically, they're saying, not us. That's too much. Um, the idea of human consumption would have been overwhelming to a Jew in that day. To think not only that you're eating flesh and drinking blood, which blood in itself was too much for them to do. They had to cook it out of the meat they, they ate. But to think that it was a human being that, in their mind, that's, that's too much. But, you know, when we look at this passage, um, that's probably not the only thing they're struggling with. You just ask them, are you, are you um, offended by this? I was talking with Chris McKenna, by the way. I'm, I'm going to give him credit on something. <clears throat> I know I joked around with him the last time I mentioned him up here. Um, I'm going to give him credit on something. He, he said, so one way you can understand it, that is, are you appalled by this? Yeah, that's what's going on. They were appalled by it. Um, it's not just the idea of drinking his blood, though, and eating his flesh. Um, they're appalled by that he's letting them know they have to come to him to have life. He's letting them know that they have to have faith in a person, in him in particular, that he is the one who gives life. You see, our faith as Christians is not in a philosophy. It is not in a movement. It is not in a theology even or even a creed. Our faith is in a person. In particular, our faith is in the person of Jesus Christ. And they were struggling with that. <clears throat> Let me give you a negative example of, of <coughs> what happens when we place our faith in something similar to Jesus or something in addition to Jesus. Um, some of you have heard of Dr. Bart Ehrman at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, Dr. Ehrman uh, is known, well known for um, seeking to dissuade students, especially those that claim to be Christians, uh, from their faith in Christ. Um, Ehrman says that he didn't start off uh, as an evangelistic uh, agnostic or atheistic or atheist, meaning that he was not setting out to try to proselytize toward, uh, toward lack of faith or, or atheism. Uh, he started off as what he would see, uh, say is a Christian. Um, Bart Ehrman, you may not realize, was an extreme fundamentalist at one point in time. Um, and then he says that he became moderate. Uh, he uses a different terminology. And then he became a liberal Christian. And then at some point in time, he encountered suffering in a way that made him wonder, hey, suffering is a problem. If suffering exists in this way, there must not be a God thinking through things as logically as he could. Suffering was not the reason that Bart Ehrman claimed to no longer believe in Jesus, though. 
when you look at his life, you see that Ehrman's faith was actually in fundamentalism. And whenever that was attacked and he saw flaws in it, he moved to a different way of understanding and believing. And then whenever he started applying more, uh, being more consistent with the logic that he'd already embraced, he moved to liberalism. And so by the time that he's actually encountering suffering and dealing with the problem of suffering, by that point in time, he'd given up what he believed about God according to the scriptures and had become the authority over the scriptures. And so he had no answer to suffering then. So when he encounters suffering, of course it's a problem for him. <coughs> Sorry. So here's, here's a warning to us that we see when Jesus is encountering these that appear to be his disciples, but are not truly his disciples. We need to beware spiritual anemia. We need to make sure that we are taking in the meat of the word, that we are seeking to understand it according to its context, to read it, to believe it, and obey it. You see, it's, it's kind of like a human body. Like, we're supposed to take in nourishing food, then we're supposed to exercise it, and we're supposed to then crave it more, and then take it in and exercise it. The same is true with God and his word. Jesus is basically saying about himself what Moses said about God, the Lord, and his word in Deuteronomy 8.3. This is what Deuteronomy 8.3 reads. And he humbled you, and let you hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus just now said, basically, that's me. Whatever comes forth from my mouth, as Jesus, you do, you believe. That's a bold statement. That's a big deal. So when the, when the Jews at this point in time hear him saying these things, it's not just the imagery of flesh and blood they struggle with, it's the idolatry of our hearts. It's the pride that we give into. Um, pray for your elders as we go through a very small book. And there's also a small group that's going through this book as well. It's called Humility by Andrew Murray. Um, humility, uh, according to what we understand from Murray and what we think he might be right, according to scriptures, is total dependence on God. Seeing who God is as the creator and then seeing who we are as the creatures and wanting to be completely dependent on him so that he can fill us and so his glory can be displayed through us. We have to realize that we're empty, that we're needy. But the problem is, is ever since the first sin came in, we have a tendency toward pride. And as Murray puts it, pride is one of the most dangerous things that you can come across. Because it's in all of us, but it's hiding. We don't even realize it's there, but it's the most natural thing now to a fallen creature. So, here's the problem, just like the Jews faced then and as we face now. If you get 100 people in a room, there are at least 101 ways of doing things. We all think we know what's best for ourselves. We all think we know what's best for others. But Jesus is letting us know he's the only one who knows. He's the only one who has all the answers, and he alone is our life and our nourishment. So true disciples of Christ believe Jesus' words. We accept them as life for us. Because as he points out also within this passage, and we will move on to our second point, um, he points out, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. You see, apart from Christ and his word spoken into us, um, which is representing the, uh, the Spirit coming into us for those of us who believe, Apart from the Spirit operating in us, we operate only from a worldly perspective. That's still true for those of us who are in Christ. If we are not depending on the Spirit, if we are not taking in, in the words of God, if we are not obeying Christ, then we are merely operating according to a worldly perspective. As you see what he says right after this, um, he talks about how if whenever he goes to, uh, to ascend back to where he was before, that w how will you believe that? He's letting them know there's something that's going to happen. Um, that is greater than what they're seeing right now, that if it's as great as it is, they think, for him to say they have to have life in him, and he's there speaking to them physically right in front of them, there's something spiritual that is greater that is going to come. So, for those of us that are in Christ, that are true disciples of his, it's because his spirit has given us new life. So look at verses 64 through 65 with me. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. 
true discipleship doesn't hinge on us. Yes, true discipleship includes faith and is mandatory, necessary for faith to be there, but even our faith is hinged on God and not on us. How does that make you feel? Does that trouble you? Does that upset you or does that encourage you? Because this is actually supposed to be an encouragement to us. It's supposed to let us know that we are part of God's family and that he has brought us into life. Um, some of you have heard um, references and imagery to being born again. Some of you might be wondering, what in the world does that mean? Um, it's something we can walk through together if that's a question that you have. Uh, you also may have heard me say many times so far through the Gospel of John that we need new life. And once again, you might be asking, what in the world does that have to do? Please find me after service. Um, find one of our leaders after service. Let's talk through that. We'd love to walk with you through that. But for those of you who understand what I'm talking about, um, new life and new birth, that imagery is consistent with God's prior work of grace in our life. That he's the one who brings us about. Um, you don't have babies deciding of their own, hey, I think I might be conceived and then born in nine months. No, there's someone else making that decision for them. There's someone else bringing them forth in life. When we look in Genesis 1 and we, we see that God formed the man out of dust and then he breathed the breath of life in him and put his spirit into him, the man didn't decide to do that. That was God's work. So yes, we want to acknowledge that, that with God and um, what he does in salvation with us in the New Testament, we see that we have to embrace it by faith. There has to be a display of faith. So we're not, we're not saying that this is somehow against man's real will. He still has real will and he has to make a decision. But it's God who's working in him prior to this. In Ezekiel 37, um, many of you know this passage where there were dry bones all around. And God brings Ezekiel to this, this uh, desert wasteland area. And he sees these dry bones and God asks him, can these dry bones have life? And he says, you alone, O Lord, no. And he tells him to prophesy to the dry bones. And so he prophesies to the dry bones and then wind comes in or, or the spirit comes to them and brings them together. So you have these bones that are connecting to other bones with the ligaments that are forming and skin coming onto them, and then God breathing life into them like you see with Adam in Genesis 1. And he tells Ezekiel that this is for the house of Israel, that this is for Judah. Ultimately, we see that this is for the new covenant, that God puts his spirit in us and we live. So I hope it doesn't hurt your feelings too much that we have to acknowledge that we are dead apart from Christ. Ephesians 2 uh, testifies that basically we're corpses. And a corpse, just like we talked about in Ezekiel 37, can do nothing for itself. That God has to, in another way, putting it, give us a new heart. I looked up some things on um, new hearts this week because I was thinking about Jesus' parable on new wine and new wineskins. Um, Jesus said that with new wine, it has to be put into a new wineskin. Because if you put it into an old wineskin, it's going to burst. Um, Give me just a second. I'm trying not to mention something. You have to put new wine into new wineskins. Also, with a new patch, you don't put it on old clothes because if you do, it will tear the old clothes. New is for new. New wineskins are for, a new wine is for new wineskins. It made me think about hearts. We need new hearts. Have you ever thought about a newborn's heart? Their heart is able to do all kinds of amazing things as long as there's not some anomaly going on that's able to do all kinds of amazing things. Did you know that the resting heart rate of a newborn is anywhere from 90 to 160? I tried looking it up, and, um, and I, it said something to 190, and I thought that was really high. This is one of those times it's great to have a wife who's in pediatrics. She can let you know, no, it's actually this. Um, so a resting heart rate for a newborn is anywhere from 90 to 160. Imagine what a heart rate, a resting heart rate of 160 would do to someone that's older with blockages. A new heart can handle such life. In the same way, those of us who are to say that we are true disciples of Christ, at some point in time, we have to acknowledge that we've been given new hearts. Because for there to be new life in us, it has to be that a new heart is there to be able to handle that new life. So if you are saying that you are a disciple of Christ, but there has never been a change in your life where God's life is the one living through you, there is a question mark over your head. Is that true? But if that is true, where you are living this new life, if you are obeying Christ's commands, not out of legalism or formality, but because 
his word dwells within you, you can be encouraged to know God has done a work in your life to bring you from death to life, to give you a new heart to put inside of you. As he says in verse 63, the Spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. Let's move to the third point. True disciples of Christ endure in their faith in Christ. As I mentioned, I'm trying to speed up without going too fast. Did you notice the difference between those who appeared to be disciples and those who truly were Jesus' disciples? Verse 6, um, verse 66 says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walk with him. Um, a literal translation of that right there uh, could read, they went back to the things they left behind. They went back to the things they left behind. You know, this actually comes up toward the end of John's gospel. Peter and a few different disciples uh, are hanging around, and they said, let's just go fishing. And they go fishing. Um, and Jesus says, Peter, um, do you love me more than these? After he comes back in, and they've unloaded the nets. Uh, one option, even though um, it's not really clear and people debate about this, but one option is, do you love me more than these nets? Do you love me more than things that you used to do? Do you love me more than your old way of life that you found meaning in or thought you found meaning in? So uh, while the last point was supposed to be an encouragement to us, this one's actually a warning to us. Are you tempted to go back to your way of life prior to knowing Jesus? Are you tempted to value the American dream of comfort and safety over walking with the church? Do you value being accepted by another individual or group more than loving obedience to Jesus? Are you being tempted to fulfill all kinds of desires that you know are contrary to God's word, even more so you are tempted to think that you can get away with them? If that is you, please don't accept that as normal. You are in danger You need to speak with another Christian. You need to have them pray for you. You need to realize that this is a major event in your life. Here's the encouragement, though. If you take that warning seriously, it's actually a sign that you care about Jesus, that you care about his word, and you care about his life in you. Because like he says right here, like we see in verses 67 through 71, which we'll go ahead and read, Jesus knows those who are his. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Um, Look at this with me in verse 67. Uh, So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Uh, I I told a small group leader I was going to mention that particular small group. I won't give away more than that. Uh, We were watching a video together in their small group, and uh, and the person presenting on the video uh, was talking about this verse, and and they asked me, Chris, what's your views on this? I was like, I can't give away everything in the sermon I'm going to preach soon. Um, the other reason I didn't want to say anything uh, was because I didn't want to distract from what he was actually trying to get across at the point in time um, because I felt like it was going to diverge from it. Uh, here's the deal. You don't have to worry about what tone of voice Jesus used right there. Uh, the focus is not on his tone. Uh, in fact, the construction, the particular construction he uses right here is actually letting you know he expects a negative response. Um, the way that it's used, it's either a negative response or hesitancy. Uh, Jesus has already let us know before and lets us know again that he chose them, so he's not really expecting hesitancy from them. Um, He's expecting a negative response. So let me me read it this way. Um, You don't want to go away as well, do you? He's expecting them to stay. He's expecting Peter to answer in this way. Why? Because he says, like he says later, I chose you, didn't I? I'm the one who spoke life into you. So everything you're saying, Peter... I'm the one who gave you that. So here's here's the encouragement in the midst of the warning. Yes, we should check our hearts. Today is a chance to examine our hearts. Like I said, this week is a week where it humbles us to be able to see these things, and it's a chance to remember again who we are in Christ. And so we should examine our hearts to make sure we are walking with him. But here is the encouragement. We didn't choose him, at least not first. He first chose us. We're his. He loves us. He breathes his life into us by means of the Spirit, and we get to walk with him. 
So this morning, uh, at this point in time, when we go to get to sing in just a second, think on two things, please. If you are a disciple of Christ, think on the encouragement that that is, that you don't hold your life yourself. He holds you because he's given you his life. But also use it as a time of examination. Lord, is there any way in which I'm not walking with you? Is there any way in which I'm not loving you and obeying you? Lord, is there anything in your word that I'm disregarding? And use that as a time to resubmit yourself to him this morning. For those of you who have never come to know Christ in the first place, please, please, if he is working on your heart, if he's speaking his life into you, please respond. That's what babies do whenever they're brought out of the womb. And if they have life in them, they respond. It might be cries, it might be whimpers, it might be screaming, but they respond. So please, if Christ is working in you, please respond. Let's pray.